So today we have Anirudh Baral. He is a PhD student in our department. Uh, he is Professor Royce's student. He graduated from his, the Indian Institute of Technology from his bachelor degree and uh, master in science. His research interests include assessment of NOx removal and self cleaning properties of photocatalytic concrete, life cycle assessment of concrete pavement, characterization of cementitious materials, and high volume fly ash concrete. Please welcome anyone. Thanks, Jaime, for the introduction. So, today we'll talk about air pollutant removal and self cleaning properties of photocatalytic cements. Uh, this was a project funded by University of Transportation Center for Higher Preservation in Michigan State University. So, uh, initially I'll talk about what uh, what um, photocatalytic cements are, and then we'll talk about how photocatalysis works. Then we'll talk about results from our NOx removal and self printing uh, experiments, and I'll draw some major conclusions. So first, what is photocatalytic cement? Photocatalytic cement is basically normal ordinary Portland cement that we use and we just add nano titanium dioxide particles in it. So nano -ti titanium dioxide particles generally act as a photocatalyst, photocatalyst in presence of UV radiation and it can oxidize the pollutants that are present in air and water like NOx, SOx and volatile organic compounds. So in the air there are many different types of air pollutants present but we will only focus on the nitrogen oxides that are present in atmosphere. So there are two different types of nitrogen oxides that are present in the atmosphere. Those are nitric oxide and nitrogen dioxide. We generally club them together and call them NOx and it is one of the six criteria pollutants that environmental protection agency in USA controls. Uh, so we need to keep the concentration of this NOx under control so that it does not create health problems with the with the people that are living nearby. So NOx concentration is generally very high for uh, near street environment because of the vehicular pollution. So NOx is generally generated mostly from the diesel vehicles. Around 50% of the NOx emitted in USA is, comes from transportation sector. So it's a big source of pollution. And so we are trying to use this photocatalytic concrete in pavement so that we can remove the NOx from the uh, air. So concrete pavement or pavement in general covers a lot of area. So 30 to 70 percent area of a typical city is covered with pavement. So if we can use that surface area and cover it with titanium dioxide or something similar to photocatalytic concrete, it can be very beneficial to remove a lot of NOx present in the air and then we can get a much clearer air. So generally TiO2 is a little bit expensive so we plan to use it as thin bonded concrete overlay like a 2 to, three, two to 4 inch thick overlay or as the top layer of two lift pavement construction so that the cost of the pavement does not go up very significantly. So photocatalytic reaction is uh, basically there are some pollutants in here and uh, the in, in presence of UV radiation the TX product is basically a concrete that has titanium dioxide in it that can react with oxygen and water to form this uh, activated, oxy activated oxygen species called uh, hydroxyl radical and superoxide radical that can react with nitric oxide and nitrogen dioxide to form nitrates that get precipitated on, on top of the concrete surface and when there is rain uh, then it gets washed away as nitrates and it goes into water. So our air becomes cleaner of the nitric oxide and nitrogen dioxide. So as I told previously titanium dioxide absorbs photons that are present in UV light and gets excited. So titanium dioxide has to absorb photons that have higher energy than the activation energy of the titanium dioxide particles to get excited. So when the titanium dioxide par particle absorbs light that has higher energy than the activation energy of titanium dioxide particles, it creates electron hole play hole and electron. This electron hole reacts with water to form hydroxyl radical 
and this electron reacts with oxygen present in the atmosphere to form superoxide ion and this hydroxyl radical uh, uh, reacts with nitric oxide to form HNO2 which again reacts with another hydroxyl radical to form NO2 and NO2 directly NO2 directly can can uh, react with hydroxyl radical to form nitrates or or NO directly can react with superoxide radical to form nitrate. So nitrate and HNO3, these are the final reaction products. So these products, these, ni these nitrate products gets deposited on the concrete surface and later get washed away by the rain. So we'll study some of the specimen, cement based specimens with white ordinary Portland cement, cal calcium sulfalaminate balance cement. This is a cement that is much more greener than ordinary Portland cement. It has very less greenhouse gas emission and we'll use different water to cement ratio and with or, with or without flash. So motivation. So we know that NOx removal decreases with carbonation and carbonation of concrete is a, is a, is a method that occurs universally, like you cannot stop it. So, so calcium silicate hydrate and calcium hydroxide present in, uh, in concrete gets carbonated and forms calcium carbonate that can decrease the porosity of the concrete and if the porosity of the concrete decreases then the NOx cannot get into the concrete surface concre into the concrete and the NOx removal decreases. Similarly the calcium carbonate that can that forms can also cover up the titanium dioxide particles and then light cannot reach the titanium dioxide particles activated titanium dioxide so NOx removal again decreases. We also know that why photocatalytic cement has higher NOx removal because of higher diffuse reflectance. So if you guys remember from school days, there are two types of ref reflection. Uh, this specular reflection is what happens in the mirrors that we use in daily life and diffuse reflectance is what happens around our, around our environment like this wall is doing diffuse reflectance because the surface is not very smooth. So, what happens is that if there is higher diffuse reflectance, like here, the white cement has higher diffuse reflectance. So, so the light can hit the white cement and then it can get reflected to different titanium dioxide particles, activated, activating those titanium dioxide particles. If the diffuse reflectance is low, then the amount of titanium dioxide particles activated due to diffuse reflectance will be much lower. That's why we see a higher NOx removal for white photocatalytic cement. So as I mentioned before, we will study some NOx removal of cement based specimens with different cements and types. So this is the this is the test setup we will use. Uh, so this is the schematic, I will get into details. So this is what it looks like, it kind of looks horrible but I will get into details slowly. So this is the zero air cylinder and this is the nitric oxide cylinder. So they mix together and so we need to we need to control the concentration of nitric oxide in the gas flow like input gas flow so we have a mass flow controller that looks something like that and we also need to control the humidity of the of the gas flow in that goes into the photocatalytic chamber where we the reaction will happen so we also have a humidifier that provides humidity in the in the zero air so that we get a get a relative humidity of 50% here and then generally when we test we close this valve off and the gas flows through here and it goes out and goes into the NOx analyzer and the NOx analyzer analyzes how much uh, you know nitric oxide and nitrogen dioxide is in the output gas and then it goes out to exhaust. Uh, so this is how the photocatalytic chamber looks like. So we have UV light here, in the, this is a basically a black box and we have UV light in here and this is the photocatalytic chamber, this, this is where the sample generally stays. Uh, and this is the NOx, NOx analyzer, this is uh, the basic machine, you can get the reading from here or you can also use the USB port here uh, to get the data and these are the different ports that we like, this is a sample port, so we we make sure that the sample port gets connected here and we can measure the concentration of nitric oxide and nitrogen oxide using this machine. So do any of you have any questions regarding the setup?
Okay. Um, so this is actually a standard setup. So we are using a international standard method. They also specify the UV intensity that we need to use in the test and relative humidity. We did some modifications like we reduced the flow rate from 3 liter per minute to 1 liter per minute so that it and we also decrease the inlet nitric oxide concentration from here uh, to 1000 parts per billion to 500 parts per billion. Uh, this is done so that uh, even though this test is very accelerated test but we want to make sure that the test is still close to the what is there in the environment. So EPL limit is 50 parts per billion which is actually much lower than 500 parts per billion but it's still better to use a 500 parts per billion compared to 1000 parts per billion. So the sample, we tested two different kinds of samples. First, the samples were 56 day moist cured. Those will be called non-carbonated specimens. And then those non-carbonated specimens were put in accelerated carbonation chamber for 28 days. Those will be called carbonated specimens. So when we do the test, so this is the inlet concentration. So the so the inlet concentration is 500 parts per billion. It stays stable and then we switch on the UV light. When the UV light is switched on, the reaction starts occurring. And when the reaction starts occurring, there is sharp jump in NOx concentration. And slowly, you can see that NOx remove this, this much, this height is the amount of NOx that's removed. So, so this is the blue line is the nitric oxide concentration and the red line is the nitrogen dioxide concentration. So if we add them up, we get the amount of nitric NOx concentration. So we are interested in how much total NOx has been removed. So this graph is very complicated. So uh, it, we basically need to get to a numbers that we can use to compare different samples. So we use a parameter called photovoltaic efficiency factor, PEF. So this is basically average NOx removal per unit area per unit time and the unit is micromole per meter square hour. This is a little bit complicated formula but the thing you need to focus on is this part. So basically we have made this part is how much NOx is getting removed then we are averaging it over time and then this is some uh, this is F is flow rate and this is basically some this is a constant and this is basically some factor with time and area of the specimen so that we get uh, average NOx removal per unit time per unit area. We also use some uh, optical properties because I, as I told you diffuse reflectance is a big part, big, big thing that plays a role in uh, NOx removal. So, so it's basically average, average diffuse reflectance in between 350 nanometer and 385 nanometer wavelength. And 385 nanometer light was chosen because 385 nanometer light has uh, energy of 3.18 electron volt, which is exactly equal to the activation energy of the titanium dioxide particles. So we 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 have a, we have reflectance of the specimen from from this graph, and we also measure the spectrum of the UV light that we are using in our test, and we convolute them and divide it by the total UV light energy that is there and we get the average uh, UV reflectance of the specimen. So this is the basic uh, result. Uh, so I'll just quickly go through the terminology of the of the specimens that I've named. So the first part is a cement type, W represent white ordinary Portland cement, and C represent calcium sulfur aluminate bellite cement. The second part is how much water to cement ratio there is. So W4 and W4 is 0.4 water to cement ratio and uh, W6 is 0.6 water to binder ratio. T0, T2.5 and T5 are the amount of titanium dioxide we have and basically T0 is no titanium dioxide and T2.5 is 2.5 percent titanium dioxide and T5 is 5 percent titanium dioxide and F0 is no fly ash and F15 is 15 percent fly ash. And we also have Results for carbonated and non-carbonated carbonated samples. Yeah. I was just curious on the percents of uh, titanium dioxide. Yeah. And, and I guess I go back your specimens. Are they uh, cement paste or is it concrete with aggregate? Uh, this is this is cement paste. 
So that's by weight of cement? Yeah. Um, the fly ash is also by weight of the cement, by the way. So we'll get into the results right now. So initially I'll talk about how water to binder ratio affects uh, PF. So we can see that, uh, sorry. So we can see that, uh, see, if we compare these two results, you can see that the non-carbonated samples had higher NOx removal for higher water to binder ratio. This happens because with a higher water to binder ratio, we have a higher porosity, surface porosity, and thus the uh, uh, NOx removal or PEF goes up as well. And and uh, yeah, if we look at the carbonated specimens like here and here, you can see that there is actually a decrease in NOx removal. Uh, this happens because if we have higher to higher water to binder ratio, the samples initially will have higher porosity. But it will also have chance to get carbonated much faster because higher porosity means faster carbonation. So these samples actually had much higher carbonation than uh, these samples. So that's why we are seeing a lower NOx removal for the carbonated samples for water to cement ratio of 0 0.6. Even though we see a higher NOx removal for water to binder ratio of 0 0.6 compared to water to binder ratio of 0 0.4. Okay. Uh, so next, uh, next we'll talk about what, uh, how the cement type affects the NOx removal. We can see that, so these are the, these are the calcium sulfonate cement samples, like that which starts with C, and W is the white OBC sample. So you can see that the white OBC samples had much higher NOx removal compared to the calcium sulfonate bellite cement in both carbonated and non-carbonated cases. So the reason behind that is uh, could be two. Uh, first, you can if you look at the the average UV reflectance value, the EUVR parameter, the white cement had much higher EUVR compared to the the calcium sulfide aluminate bellite cement for both carbonated and non-carbonated specimens. So that could be one reason. Other reason could be that the pore solution pH of calcium sulfide aluminate bellite cement is much lower than pore solution pH of ordinary Portland cement. Pore solution pH of calcium sulfonate bellite cement is generally around 12.6 to 12.7 and for pore solution pH of ordinary Portland cement that value goes up to 30. So if the pore solution pH is much higher, the activated oxygen species that are generated like hydroxyl radical or superoxide ion, they tend to react back with hydrogen ion to form water and if the pH of the pore solution is higher, they they prefer to attack the nitrogen dioxide or nitric oxide to form nitrates, which is which is what we want. So higher pore solution pH means higher NOx removal. Uh, so effect of fly ash on PEF, again we saw that uh, increasing fly ash complete is actually decreasing the NOx removal for both white Portland cement and uh, calcium sulfur and bellite cement. So we also think that the, the major reason behind this is because of again lower pore solution pH when we replace cement with fly ash. So the key takeaways quickly, um, as I told you before, the carbonation decreased uh, the NOx removal efficiency. Uh, white Portland cement had higher NOx removal than um, gray, than calcium sulfonate bellite cement. Uh, fly ash addition decreased the NOx removal in non-carbonated states, but it helps to uh, mitigate the adverse effect of carbonation. Uh, we also saw that increasing water to binder ratio increase the non-carbonated PF, but we don't know exactly what will happen for carbonated PA, carbonated specimen because sometimes higher water to binder ratio leads to a more carbonated samples. And we also saw that increasing k 2 content did not increase NOx removal by too much, like it increased but it was not very significant, like you can see this one uh, with, um, let's say this one, like almost similar, this one and this one. So uh, do you have any questions on this part? Okay, so I will now discuss about uh, the self-cleaning efficiency part. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. So first, like, when you say uh, photo uh, catalytic, yeah. is 
cement. Yep. It's only done by adding the titanium yep. oxide. Yep. So what what the, what the catalytic cement means? Titan T I O to add in cement. Yeah. There's exactly. no other way to do. Yeah, that that's all it is. And the second question is that, for example, when you add, when you put a slab, concrete slab, so what is the expected depth of the reaction between the cement and the atmosphere? Like how deep you think that this reaction is gonna go? Probably one or two micron. One to two micron. So in the, in the application, you, you expect this cement to be used only for the surface? On, only on the surface, yeah. Not, not in the concrete mix, like it's just like a kind of a... So, so that's why we are saying that this should be used in a thinner, thinner concrete pavements like thin bonded concrete overlay or in two lift pavement construction where we can use a very thin top layer. Okay. Okay. So uh, first is the uh, photocatalytic cement, is that something that's commercially available? With the titanium dioxide already added? Yes, there is, it is commercially available right now, especially in Europe. So uh, there is some companies, there was a big project with Missouri University as well. So they constructed a full scale pavement. There is another project with uh, uh, Texas Austin University as well. They are using titanium dioxide, this photocatalytic cement in the, in the divider between the traffic lines, like uh, divider between two two direction traffic, you know, yeah. So, one other thought, uh, since there's a very limited depth of reactivity, has there been any thought about, uh, say, broadcasting this material over the surface and then finishing it into the top? Because they do that with, like, surface hardeners and coloring for concrete. Yeah. You know, you can place normal concrete and then broadcast that yeah. over it and then work it into the surface. Yeah, some people, have developed coating like they they use it after the concrete has been finished so they use a thin coating and titanium dioxide like is also used in paints as well like people use it uh, it on buildings because uh, yeah that also helps it with nox removal too like if you use it in like normal paint like here i was suggesting that while the concrete is relatively fresh yeah. before it would ever be hardened yeah. during the finishing process. You know, uh, yes. Say the paving machine goes over it before they float it. Yeah. You broadcast some material over it and when they float it, it actually gets worked into the surface of the concrete yeah. that's placed. Then you probably get that type of depth of the yeah, reaction. Yeah. So yeah. That you're, you're not paying that premium for the rest of your yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know anything that has been done like you are saying, but most of the people who wants to want just a surface layer, they go for coating. So, uh, yep. Last, I'd like to, so, so the application part of this uh, titanium oxide based uh, cement, uh, cement, do you use it as a concrete or mostly like a cement based or mortar based something? Like that? So, this is still under development. So, people generally. <coughs> There are many studies that has done it, but mostly people tend to use it in concrete directly, like for as of now, like the project that has, has been done. So the testing, right follow up question is the testing you are doing, you are doing it in a cement base, right? Yeah. So since if people mostly use it as part of concrete, yeah. then are there any effects of aggregates to titanium oxide? Aggregate should not have any effect on titanium dioxide, but aggregate can have an effect on porosity of the sample. So that may affect the performance here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this is kind of a follow up, but so for, for if I add this titanium dioxide to anything, so that becomes photocatalytic? Uh, essentially, yes, there has been even studies of adding titanium dioxide on asphalt, con asphalt concrete. Yeah, that's what's going on. Yeah. So or there has been some studies. But yeah, yeah, we can, but again, so I talked about uh, diffuse reflectance. Asphalt has a very low diffuse reflectance. Like I talked about diffuse reflectance uh, probably here. So asphalt has very low diffuse reflectance. So it can happen that asphalt may not show as good of as good property as concrete. So that's why initially the 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 starting research has been mostly on concrete. Well, but it's not the it's surface characteristics. Right? It's not the or some, somehow if you make the surface long, 
No, no, diffuse reflectance of asphalt will be much lower than that of concrete, right? We can talk later. I can make okay. these pictures are a little confusing because what I understand is just because of the surface characteristics. But yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the idea is we need higher diffuse reflectance. And the rough surface is true for asphalt or concrete. Like both have enough rough surface to happen for diffuse reflectance to happen. But asphalt has a very high absorptivity, right? So it cannot have that high diffuse reflectance. So I'll now quickly go over the self-cleaning part. Yep. So actually photocatalytic cement started with this self-cleaning part. So there was some guy in Italy called Luigi Scasser who thought that white cement should stay whiter as long as possible. So he thought of adding titanium dioxide to cement and they made a nice charge called Jubilee Church in Rome. So this is still much whiter than normal church stays. So people have a paper on that. But we are also interested in self-cleaning just because of Knox removal. Because we know that if Knox removal of photocatalytic concrete decreases with soiling because the reaction site gets covered up. And we also know that the similar to what we saw for Knox removal, like the, if the activated oxygen species are generated, they can oxidize the organic pollutants that get deposited on the concrete surface. So that's why we are interested in self cleaning. So to test this self cleaning property, what we do is we apply a rhodamine B dye on the on the concrete or mortar surface. So we don't know what kind of dye can be present in the present in the environment, but rhodamine B is taken as a representative pollutant, like you cannot characterize everything, so you just choose one. Rhodamine B is just one of them. And it looks red in color. So after that we measure the reflectance of the sample again, and then we expose this sample under UV light for 26 hours, and we again measure the reflectance. And if you see that it doesn't look red at all, because the rhodamine B on the surface has been degraded by the photocatalytic cement. So when you look at the reflectance, you can see that, so here at zero hour, there, this is like a huge dip because there is uh, a lot of rhodomine B here and they absorb light around 555 nanometer. So, so here the reflectance is very low at zero hour. And as time progresses, the rhodomine B gets degraded and the reflectance goes up. And at 26 hours, you can see that the curve is almost flattened out. So it means that almost all the rhodomine B has degraded. So this one was a very good good uh, sample that had very good, nice cell cleaning efficiency. So it had 5% titanium dioxide and glass aggregate too. Did I miss? Yeah. Uh, so we had very nice cell cleaning part. And this specimen did not have very good cell cleaning. So you can see that even after 26 hours, it's not like, it's not very flat, but it has still improved. And if you don't have any titanium dioxide, you don't see any change at all because there is no degradation of rhodomine B. So again, we, we have this reflectance graph, but we need a number. So to get a number, what we do is we convert this reflectance to color. So there is a color system called CIE LAB system. So it's an ASCM standard. So it, it basically has six coordinates. So if you look at it, if A star, so there are L star, A star and B star. So that's why it's called CIE LAB system. So if the sample is very white, L star goes to 100 and if it is black, it's zero. And if the sample is towards red, it's A star value becomes positive. If it is towards green, A star value becomes negative. If the sample is bluer, it's blue becomes negative. And if it is yellow, blue becomes, po B, B star becomes positive. So our sample is red in color. So we'll start use just the ester value and we'll measure the relative change in ester value after 26 hours. So what samples we need to test? We are testing here some mortar specimens, okay? So we used gray ordinary Portland cement and calcium sulfalimonate bellite cement again because calcium sulfalimonate bellite cement is much greener than ordinary Portland cement. With or without fly ash and we use different titanium dioxide content as well. We use recycled glass aggregate. So there was a study in Hong Kong University by Professor Poon. He is a very famous guy. 
that and he claimed that glass aggregate helps in knox removal because if there is glass aggregate then the light the sun ray or uv light can pass through the glass ray and activated other titanium dioxide particles that are below the concrete surface so the reaction surface area does not remain just the one or two micron that we are talking about before so we were thinking like that that may also help with mm, with self cleaning as well but people have not tested it with self cleaning so we thought uh, of going ahead and do that so we 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 moisture the sample for 7 days and then put the sample in in normal environment condition for 7 days because that's what the standard says <laughs> so this is what the result we get so here you can see that here we show that the glass percentage and these are the ordinary Portland cement data and this is the calcium sulfalonate bellite cement data. R26 is the, as I told you before, is the measurement of the self cleaning. So we want this value to be as high as possible. So if it reaches 100, it means that almost all the rhodamine B has been degraded. So you can see that uh, for ordinary Portland cement, if we increase the glass aggregate, there is a increase in self cleaning. Again, if we increase the titanium dioxide content, we can see an increase in self cleaning efficiency. But for calcium sulfaluminate bellite cement, we see that if we increase the glass aggregate amount or increase the titanium dioxide content, we don't see very significant increase in self cleaning efficiency or any change at all. So increasing glass aggregate and increasing titanium dioxide content, both should theoretically increase the amount of activated titanium dioxide content, right? Like here I, I showed you guys that if there is glass aggregate, more titanium dioxide particles should get activated. Similarly, if we have more titanium dioxide, there should be more activated titanium dioxide. Yep. Your glass percentage, it goes up to 100. Yep. So is that as a function of the sand percentage amount. of total aggregate or of cement? Of, of sand. So sand we, we are replacing sand with, with fine, fine glass aggregate. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, yep. So if you look at the OBC, yep. The trend is like, for example, for, for, yeah, more 50, if you see 50%, there is a like big jump. Yep. Whereas in other cases, it's not significant. Yeah, it's not significant because, uh, you know, as we reach 100, there is no rhodomine B left, right? So if, if it is already 95 and 100, so the value of R26 cannot become more than 100. No, no, no my point is, uh, sorry, uh, I will rephrase. So, for example, you add 2.5% DIO2, right? Yep. If you see that change in from 2.5 to 5%, that change is very high in 50% yep. glass. Yep. Whereas, if you go to 25%, yep. 0%, no, 25% or 75%, that change is not as significant if you move from 2.5 to 5%. Is there any reason for that? Like why? At 50%, you see that if you add 5% instead of 2.5, yeah. you, you see such high uh, you know, self cleaning. Okay. Yep. So. Um, one reason could be that, uh, so for 2.5%, uh, here, here what could be happening is that um, for self-cleaning, so you are asking why there is a huge jump from here to here? No, no, within, like if you look 50%, yep. so for 50% there are two cases, 2.5% and 5%. Yep. Yep. At 2.5% your value is around 50%. Yep. Whereas if you go to 5% TIO2, the yep. value doubles. Yep. Whereas at 25% glass, the values from 2.5 to 5% TIO2 doesn't change that shape. Yeah, so so uh, one one reason could be that that when the glass aggregates help in increasing the amount of amount of activated titanium dioxide, but you need to have more titanium dioxide to help in increasing the amount of titanium amount of activated titanium dioxide. So if you have 50% uh, glass aggregate and 5% TIO2, what might be happening is that the light that are going through the glass aggregate are much are are helping the 5% specimen to generate more activated titanium dioxide compared to 2.5%. What are the increase from 7 to 5 is what is the Can you please repeat the question? <coughs> I'm not saying there is enough titanium. I'm saying that 
maybe 5% titanium dioxide was enough to show a significant increase in cell cleaning efficiency. I would think one of the reasons is that when you have, say, up to 25% glass aggregate, you still have sand 75%. Yeah. And sand is blocking the light which is going to yeah. Once you have enough glass aggregate, enough of the light is reaching the titanium dioxide and not being cut off by the sand. Yeah. Yeah, that, I was thinking something similarly, that once you reach some critical uh, percentage of glass aggregate, get this interconnectivity, yeah, yeah. those particles yeah. allow light to yep. uh, penetrate Go through. more yeah. deeply. Yeah. That, yeah. that, that, that is a I good explanation. I still fully explains it yeah. because why the big difference between 2.5% and titanium. Is it consistent throughout, like this is a sweet spot when you add like 50% glass percent, I mean you can maximize your efficiency. Yeah, it could be, and any, anyway we don't want to go to 100% replacement because there are strength problems and stuff like that. I am not talking about those but that is there as well. Mm, so for classifier samples, uh, what we sh 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 saw that again, the cell cleaning efficiency decreases rapidly with thiase addition. So, so we need to again think about why it's happening. Again, pore solution pH actually uh, plays a role. So we sh we we know that pore solution pH decreases when calcium sulfur unit bellite cement is used instead of ordinary Portland cement, as I discussed before. And glass of fires is also used to replace cement here, right? And that, again, at that time as well, the pore solution pH goes down. So in both cases, we are seeing that we, the, the increase in activated titanium dioxide content does not help in increasing self cleaning efficiency. So we thought of uh, going ahead and uh, designing a test that will tell us exactly what's happening. So we made some synthetic pore solution. So extracting pore solution from mortar sample is the way to do, but it's very hard to do, so we just made synthetic pore solution. We used saturated lime water that has pH of around 12.6, and then we added sodium hydroxide till we reach uh, the pH level of 12.7, 13.3, and 13.7. Then we add some rhodamine B and titanium dioxide, and we measured the absorbance of the of the solution, and then we expose the solution for 24 for four hours in UV light, and then we again measure the absorption of the samples, and we get these results. So we need absorbance value at 555 nanometer. 555 nanometer. 555 nanometer is chosen because that's where we see maximum absorbance for we for rhodamine B, like. For zero hours, there is no rhodamine B degradation, right? So that's where we see maximum degradation. And so, and for different samples with different pH, we see different level of absorption after four hours. So these four values are for after four hours of UV exposure. So we use we use these four values, like these E values, and we have A naught from the zero hour data. We just use a formula to 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 get a uh, reaction rate constant. So we here assume that the rhodamine B degradation is a first order reaction. So it comes out to be this formula, and T is the reaction rate constant. And you can see that there is a nice increase in reaction rate with increase in pH of the synthetic pore solution. So from there we we concluded that. A decrease in pore solution indeed decrease decrease the rhodamine B removal. So a decrease in pore solution is probably affecting the self cleaning performance. So uh, this is the major conclusions. Uh, photocatalytic concrete can clean air and maintain aesthetics of the concrete pavement. Uh, carbonation decreased the NOx removal performance, as I told before. Uh, white OPC generally had a much higher NOx removal than calcium sulfur aluminate bellite cement because of higher pore solution pH and higher UV reflectance. Uh, fly ash addition decreased the uh, PEF in non-carbonated non state but did not uh, but help to mitigate the effect of carbonation on uh, the photocatalytic cement. So these are the major NOx, the major conclusion from the NOx removal study. Uh, from the self cleaning study, we got these conclusions like grey ordinary Portland cement had higher self cleaning efficiency than calcium sulfur aluminate bellite cement. This is again for pH of the pore solution. So, IS addition reduced cell cleaning. Replacing sand with recycled glass aggregate improved cell cleaning because we had higher amount of activated titanium dioxide. 
pore solution pH, increasing pore solution pH, increased self cleaning, decreasing pore solution pH, decreased self cleaning. Uh, these are the references and thank you if you have any questions. Any questions? Any additional questions? Yeah. Uh, so right there in the conclusions you have the point that addition of fly ash decreases the clean, the, you know, the NOx removal, yep. but that it helps to mitigate the adverse effect of carbonation. Yep. So long term, yep. is it beneficial to add fly ash? So long term, it could be beneficial to add fly ash. Like if you look at the... Um, Yeah, if you look at the if we look at the results, sometimes what has happened is that uh, for 15 percent fly ash, even though it has decreased a little bit, it has remained stable. But we need to keep in mind that these samples were carbonated for 28 days in accelerated con condition. So that is the uh, the amount of carbonation people generally do to 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 emulate carbonation of 10 years in the field. So uh, this is kind of a uh, like question that if you want a longer long term pavement structure like 30 years or something then definitely fly ash is going to be very good but if we are just doing like 10 years then they are almost similar I, I guess I know it's your presence I'll just waste my opinion that yep. the, the post carbonation amounts are very similar and obviously there's economic benefits to using fly ash yep. and other cementitious yep. performance yes, sure. issues that benefit from that yep. so yeah I think you know, yes, you have much better performance non-carbonated yeah. initially, but it's going to more Yeah, it, it's going to stabilize, but yes, again, like, carbonation occurs much slowly in environment than what we did in our chamber, so it again depends on the how long you are keeping the pavement. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, there is a presentation that you mentioned from the beginning. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> It's generally 25 to 50%. So we actually use class F fly ash. Uh, so class F fly ash actually helps in uh, the alkali silica reaction mitigation. So if you use glass aggregate, there is a danger of alkali silica reaction. So people generally use class F fly ash to mitigate that. So we, we actually did some alkali silica reaction test as well and we saw that 25 to 50% should be good. Yeah, yeah. basically, these tests, these numbers are not going to be used in field like, yeah, yeah. These, these numbers are not going to, this is the sweet spot as was told before, like this is the probably the sweet spot. So, right in the beginning, um, when you talk about the reaction for the Nostrum work, yeah. what, en what ends up is that you have nitrates which are then yeah. washed away. Yeah. How safe are those as an environmental byproduct? So, uh, nitrates are not very safe as environmental byproduct, but the thing is, in air, even 50 parts per billion is very bad. That's the limit. But if you uh, if you go for in in water, 50 parts per billion is nothing. We go, can go to ppm level easily. So that's why we want the nitrate to be in water and not in air. Yep. So what are the what are the parameters in the field? Now when you take those results and apply titanium dioxide in the field, what are the, what are the things that the main concerns in the parameter study at this point? So there are many concerns regarding that and we actually presented it in a uh, conference recently. So firstly relative humidity. So we, we did the test at 50% relative humidity. If the relative humidity goes like close to 100%, then what happens is that nit nitric oxide and nitrogen oxide competes with water vapor to get adsorbed on the titanium dioxide. And if water gets adsorbed, that is not very helpful because we are trying to uh, remove the NOx. But if the RH is very low, let's say close to 0%, then you won't get enough activated oxygen species because ox water helps in generating, generating this hydroxyl radical, which is helpful in uh, NOx removal. There is also temperature, higher temperature. Temperature is kind of a controversial issue because Higher temperature generally means that there will be higher NOx removal, but at higher temperature, the 
nitrogen oxide gas molecules may not get absorbed on the surface because at higher temperature it's higher, harder to get absorbed on the surface. Uh, then there is UV radiation like uh, like near the equator we have higher sunlight and higher UV radiation. If you go uh, like towards polar region there will be very low sunlight. So there also it cannot work. And as the sunlight UV is also a concern because this application is more towards let's say for cities where you have thinner concrete yeah. and then the cities a lot of blockage yeah. in the urban canyons, right? You don't yeah. have yeah. UV to activate this. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Then it won't work. Yeah. Yeah. You'd uh, indicated the rate at which you were uh, introducing the NOx in the test chamber, I think, was 500. Parts yeah, it's, it's much higher. Yeah. But that the environmental limit is 50. Yeah. So I don't know if 500 is something that might ever be experienced in the so, natural environment. Yeah. And if, if you've done anything to show that see a similar type of efficiency of those lower concentrations. So, so 500 parts per billion is actually way above the no, the EPA limit and if you go like in in cities like um, Los Angeles or if you go to India or China where the cities are very polluted and if you so we need to look at NOx concentration that is on the surface okay and the vehicular emission comes like if you see the exhaust pipe it's like this much height from the surface so at that height this the NOx concentration is actually much higher than this 50 parts per billion generally NOx is measured at around 10 meter height like all atmospheric data so still 500 parts per billion is a accelerated test and if we decrease it to let's say 50 parts per billion we'll see a higher NOx removal efficiency but lower NOx removal like the efficiency will go up like probably right now we are removing 20% of it, we will probably remove 30 or 40% of it, but as the inlet concentration is lower, we will remove total lesser NOx. Any more questions? Okay, so let's take our speaker.